Hello, I'm Tyler Bamford, Leventhal Research Fellow here at the National World War II Museum. And today I'm here with Seth Peredin, historian also at the National World War II Museum. And we're going to talk about the liberation of Kaufering by the 101st Airborne Division on April 27th. So Seth, can you tell me a little bit about the 101st Airborne Division's experiences leading up to the liberation of Kaufering? Absolutely, sure can. So the 101, uh, of course, jumped into Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944, 5th of June, depending on what time, but, <laughs> but they were a green division. You know, uh, the other American Airborne Division that jumped into Normandy, of course, was the 82nd. Mm -hmm. And the 82nd had seen a lot of combat, whereas the 101 had not seen any. Um, the 101st jumped into Normandy. They fought in Normandy for, you know, a, a, more than a month. I forget exactly how many days, but it was well over a month. Uh, they went back to England, and of course they jumped in uh, into Holland in September 1944 during Operation Market Garden. Uh, they saw, actually, frankly, uh, heavier action in Holland for a longer sustained period of time than they actually did in Normandy. Most people don't know that. Um, after Market Garden, they were pulled back into uh, different parts of France to rest and refit and recuperate. And then, of course, they were thrown in the bulge uh, in December 1944. And, of course, a famous story about the 101st is, you know, in being encircled in Bastogne and holding the area of Bastogne. Um, but their war didn't end there, of course. You know, they were put down, uh, elements were put down uh, towards Hagenau near the French and German border. And they were part of the uh, Seventh Army's thrust into mm -hmm. southern Germany in 1945, and, um, and that's what brings us to... So Gotham. this was a very experienced division. They'd seen a lot of combat yeah. and a lot of turnover in personnel? Absolutely. You know, you got to remember, too, um, by 1945, April 1945, we're talking about here, there were guys that had made that jump into Normandy, quite a few, actually, mm -hmm. but, you know, by and large, a lot of the older veterans had been wounded or killed, frankly, or were recuperating in hospitals or been rotated out or whatever. So there was an influx of new people, especially after the Battle of the Bulge. You know, they suffered a lot of wounded, a lot of casualties in the Bulge. A lot, a lot of people got hurt from frostbite, you know, not yeah. necessarily even enemy fire. So there were a lot of new people in the unit mm -hmm. uh, in that time. So I heard that uh, that the the ca casualty rate for this division was over 100 percent just because of how much turnover there was. You know, even right. the replacements were highly likely to get injured. So when all these men, so the division's about what 18,000 men ish, when they come across across Kalfering, you know, what what kind of scene greets them? Well, you know, when they're they're pushing through Germany in the late portions of the war like this, you know, a lot of the veterans that were there. And some are even, even the new guys who hadn't made those combat jumps. You know, you got airborne paratroopers who hadn't made a combat jump in the 101st yeah. in 1945. Um, you know, the war is winding down, uh, and, and it's, they're kind of they're being a little, I don't want to say disillusioned, but they're kind of wondering, you know, when is it going to end? What is this all about? Why are we even here? Mm -hmm. We've liberated France, Belgium, Holland, da-da-da-da-da-da. And now we're in Germany, you know, what, what is going on, what's next? And then they come across this camp. And this, of course, Kaufering was a sub-camp of Dachau. Dachau is outside of Munich, is outside of Munich. And um, Dachau was huge, and it wasn't just the main camp, of course. There was 11 sub-camps, of which Kaufering was one. And I found out in my research that Kaufering itself had 11 sub-camps, wow. which is kind of kind of odd, really, for a camp like this. It's important to mention that there's thousands of these camps all throughout Germany, oh, yeah. some in, in the suburbs of major cities like Berlin, others in very rural and isolated areas. And this was one of those. Okay. And, and it could, well, I mean, Munich, of course, is a big city, but uh, Kaufering was uh, near the town of um, Landsberg am Lech in Bavaria, which is kind of kind of in the middle of nowhere, really. So this is going to fall within the American occupation zone, too. Absolutely. So what was the scene? How, how many people were in Kaufering when the 101st got there? Uh, from reports that I saw, there were about 500-ish, give or take. Um, there were a lot of, as one may expect when liberating a, a concentration camp, there were a lot of dead. Um, Lan uh, not Landsberg, but Kaufering, uh, it was different in that, you know, concentration camps by nature are, you know, filthy, filthy places, but Kaufering was among the worst in terms of cleanliness or lack thereof. Um, the inmates actually lived in holes in the ground, and the holes in the ground were covered with like thatched hut roofs. So the disease and the vermin that were, it, it was rampant in there. So the people were absolutely filthy. They were, you know, deathly ill. And the Germans, when they pulled out of the camp, um, those who could not make the forced march, mm -hmm. uh, some of them, about, like we said, you know, the, the number w were left there in the camp. Some of them who were too sick to even move were herded into several of the huts, and the huts were lit on fire, and these people were burned alive. 
um, and that's the scene that greeted these troopers when they when they uh, reached the camp's gates. And that had to be you know traumatizing for these these men. You know they had seen so much war right. and they'd been you know accustomed to seeing you know bodies mutilated and mangled. But this was a whole different experience. Absolutely. Yeah. You know if you talk to any liberator, any American liberator of any concentration camp, they all all of them say that. I mean to a man, they all say that. You know I'd seen you know friends die and but I'd never seen anything like this. Right. And and you know uh, just stacks of charred corpses of, you know, literally skeletons, like human skeletons, right. you know, that are staggering around in a day's state. It was something out of, you know, of a nightmare. Right. Was the 101st one of the only divisions uh, in this part of Germany at the time? No. As I said, they were part of the 7th Army, so there was, you know, a lot of divisions there. But, you know, as I said, Kalfring had 11 subcamps of itself, in, in itself. And uh, the 101st didn't liberate all 11 subcamps. Uh, the 103rd Infantry Division the 36th Infantry Division, the T-Patchers, uh, the 63rd Infantry Division, and the 12th Armored were all are all recognized as liberating units uh, as from elements of Kaufering. So it wasn't just 101st. They do get the lion's share of the credit, and I think part of that may be the... Uh, the, the Band of Brothers <laughs> mythology. Exactly, sure. exactly. But there were other units there, to be sure. Yeah. By VE Day, May 8, 1945, there's 1. 1.6 million American soldiers in Germany, and over a million of them had witnessed or liberated these camps. And as we come across upon the anniversary of uh, the, the victory in Europe, it's important to remember what this victory meant for so many and the experiences of both the liberators and the liberated.